Happy New Year's Eve. Wasn't sure who would be here. It's good to see you all. So you're getting ready to, no, I was going to say you're getting ready to go out and party, but this is the party right here, right here tonight, worshiping the Lord like John said earlier. And uh, we do begin a new series today called Priorities, and it's an appropriate series in light of this new year. And, uh, you know, you think about priorities, and really priorities drive our life. I mean, if you really consider with me the power of priorities, like the priorities determine where you're going. Priorities determine what you're about. Priorities determine uh, what decisions you'll make. And so, uh, you know, this series, God, I believe uh, God can change your life with this series. Now, of course, I think that about every series, but I'm really fired up about this little mini series, three weeks today and the next uh, two weeks uh, because of the importance of uh, priorities uh, in our lives. You saw in the lobby a whole lot of life group promo. You saw the video. This is the time if you're not signed up for a group to get plugged in. We have this three-week window where we want to get well, we want to get all of you plugged into a life group. And so you'll see there in your uh, program a brochure on uh, life groups. And uh, during my message here. Uh, if it's boring, I give you permission to read through this, okay, and find out, uh, because we're doing some things a little bit different. Uh, for example, once this three-week uh, window is closed, we won't, uh, we won't be taking any more sign-ups for life groups. So this is the time to get plugged in if you're not plugged in yet. And in your program, inside the brochure is a list of the open groups, and these are all, a bunch of them, a bunch of them still open. You can see the names of the leaders, you can see the nights they meet, location, uh, what what they're um, what they're focusing on, and uh, and also the highlighted groups, the color, uh, those are brand new groups, and so we're really excited about the brand new groups that are that are getting started. So um, this is a ten week season for life groups, and at the end of that ten weeks, you'll have the option of staying in the group, going to a new group, or taking a break. Okay, so that, that's what's we're happening uh, here with new groups rolling out. And if you're like, man, I don't know if I'm signed up for a group. If you're already in a group, you're probably signed up. Hopefully your leader signed you up. If your leader did not sign you up, you might want to double check. And out in the lobby, there's like four different tables uh, to get signed up for life groups. And then there's a table off to the right. And I think Kathy is out there, Kathy Brown. And that is life group, specialty life groups. And those focus on various uh, topics that you can see in your program uh, some of the specialty topics for this winter season. Okay, we're going to roll right into this teaching and look at the principles of priorities. A couple things I want to say about priorities before we get into our, our main topic today. Uh, number one, priorities are like paths. And let me, let me just talk about an analogy between paths and priorities. A path is a route from point A to point B that we take over time uh, in a consistent way. So we, we pretty much cut a groove. And that's what a path is. It's, it's a groove, you know, literally in the earth that a lot of people have, you know, walked uh, down. And so there might be a lot of ways to get from point A to point B, but there is typically a preferred path that we have uh, to get there. Now, what I'm suggesting is that in our life, priorities are like paths because there are preferred paths to get from point A to point B, and our priorities either lead to life or to death. So the path that you're on, here's a profound statement, the path you're on leads to its appointed destination. Like, whether you like it or not, whatever path you're on, that's taking you somewhere. Ever, ever been on the wrong road and ended in the wrong place? See, you thought you were on the right road, but it really didn't matter what you thought. What mattered was reality. Which road were you on? And because and so, that road is going to take you where it's going. So if you choose the wrong path, it'll take you where you don't want to go. Now, nobody says, I want to get on the path to destruction. 
right? And this year, is it ACDC, Highway to Hell? Okay, they sing about it, but nobody really says, okay, I, I want, in five years, I want my marriage just to be blown up. Nobody says, you know what, uh, I, I, I want all of my kids to not be walking with the Lord. That's, that's what I want with my life, all right? I mean, nobody, nobody says, I, I, I want, my goal is to be addicted to drugs and alcohol, pornography, gambling, spending, whatever. Uh, nobody says that, all right? But if you choose the wrong path, that's exactly where you're going. Now, this idea of path is a powerful metaphor in the Bible. We see it all the time. God, t- God tells us that our life is like this journey and that certain paths lead to freedom, joy, fulfillment, great relationships to what Jesus would call life. And then there are other paths that lead to heartache, agony, frustration, regret, broken relationships, ruin, financially, physically, whatever. The Bible calls those paths the paths to death. Now here's a few examples. God says to Joshua, when he was going to take over for Moses, leading the Israelites into the promised land, he said this, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. So God's saying, pay careful attention to your life and to the instruction that I give, because my word is like a path. Don't get off the path to the left or to the right. And God knows what will lead us to success and fulfillment and joy. And he knows what will lead us to pain and destruction. God loves us so much and he knows what's best. And he says, stay on that path. About 800 years later, God said this to the prophet Jeremiah when the nation was in disarray and falling apart in every way. This is what the Lord says, Jeremiah 6, 16, stand at the crossroads. So he's saying you're at a crossroad in your, 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 your existence as a nation. You can go one way or you can go the other way. You have to decide which path you're going to take. So he says stand at the crossroads and look. In other words, pay attention. And I love this. Ask for the ancient paths. The ancient paths, which is the word of God. And, and what God calls life, the path to life. And ask where the good way is and walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls. So again, pay close attention to where you're going. Choose your paths carefully. And of course, we see throughout the Proverbs, path language all over the Proverbs. The path to this will be good. The path to that will destroy you. And uses this path language. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is an example. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own wisdom and understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Okay, as you go through life, lean into God, not your own understanding. So that's the first principle, that life is like a path, and our priorities are really uh, uh, paths. Number two, our choices reveal our priorities. See, when we talk about priorities, we're talking about those things that matter most to us in life. That's what a priority is, what matters most. Now, don't, don't miss this. There's a big difference in what we say our, our priorities are and what they really are. There's a big difference in what we intend our priorities to be, what we wish they were, and what they actually are. Because we want to believe that priorities are demonstrated by, by our intentions, but the truth is priorities are demonstrated by our actions. The actions are, are the tell-all indicator of what our priorities really are. Are. And we have a great capacity for self deception. A couple of guys said this in their book, The Power of Full Engagement. Facing the truth about the gap between who we want to be and who we really are is never easy. Each of us has an infinite capacity for self deception. So we'll say this is a priority, but is it really? I mean, we might say, my priority is to get in shape and to lose, you know, a bunch of weight, okay, while I'm holding the 20-ounce Frappuccino and a donut. 
So, I mean, really, what is, what's my, my priority really isn't to get into shape. Someone could say, my priority is fellowship and being plugged in the people of God and church and, and life group. But then they're gone every weekend. So you can see what their priority is. Some, someone might say, my priority is to get my finances in order and to get out of debt. Again, watch their life. That'll show you what their priorities really are. Our choices never lie to you, okay? They will show what our priorities are. Look at, look at our choices. We might say, I want to get closer to God. Well, let's see what our choices are to see if that is actually going to happen. Because if all we have is desire, I desire to be closer to God, then, then all we have is talk. Like, like I say, when it's all said and done, it's all said, it's not really done. It's just, it's just a desire. It's not really a priority. So we got to be brutally honest about that. Number three, new priorities require a plan. And just briefly touching on this, and I'll give you a couple of things that aren't in your notes, but when we talk about a plan, people that change have a plan. And a plan, there's three things about a plan. We could talk a long time about this, but that's not my point. But I want to share it because it's a Saturday night, okay, and I can go a little longer because you're going to be up till midnight anyway, right? <laughs> So a plan first requires a clear destination. Like, wh wh where are you going? Like, is it health? Is it health plan? Is it a relationship plan? Is it, is it, is it about your faith, relationship with God plan? You know, what, what is that? You need to have a destination. If it's just, again, if it's just desire, it's just talk, okay? So what is the plan? And then you need a clear motivation. So why are you wanting to do this? Because if it's just, well, I want to, you know, I'm going to lose weight because I want to look better, you know, or, or I want to, you know, uh, I want to feel good about what, I mean, it's got to be built, of course, on the glory of God. You're doing this for God. You're doing this for other important reasons in your relationships. So there's got to be a clear motivation. And then there's got to be clear directions. Like, you can't just say, well, I'm going to get closer to God this year. <laughs> it's, well, how? What specifically are we going to do? So that's, that's what a good plan looks like. Number four Right priorities often feel wrong. How many of you have learned this? Where it's like we've done something a certain way for a long time. It's tough to change. I mean, especially at first when we've been on this wrong path a long time. Just using the credit card and running up the credit card. That just feels right. That's been our path from point A to point B or wherever it's going. I mean, when, when we, say, we, we say, well, you know, if I don't watch three hours of TV at night, it just feels strange. To do something different, to get on a new priority often feels wrong, feels strange, feels weird. Two, me two dinners, that's our path. Bag of chips before bed, if that's our path, if that's, if that's what we typically do, then it's going to feel strange to get on a better path. That's just really the point here that we realize this doesn't come easy, getting on new paths, new priorities. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Actually, God put that in the Proverbs twice, chapter 14 and chapter 16. Matthew 7 13, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So again, catch the journey language there? Journey language. It's saying wide is the road. It's an easy road to, to be on to destroy your life or, or certain aspects of your life, my life. It's the way most people go. It's, it's the natural thing. But if we want to honor the Lord, if we want to see some real positive changes in our lives over this next year, then we're going to have to go the road less traveled. It's the road less traveled. It's the hard road. It's the road that maybe in your flesh you don't want to take. But oh man, you get down that road a ways and you'll be like, man, what took me so long? This is This is amazing. And five, new priorities require trade-offs. So important in this 
frantic, crazy culture we live in with all of these choices and all of these options. And I mean, I'm telling you, it is so easy to get our lives ratcheted, to be so busy, whether you're working, retired, whether you have kids in the home, kids out of the home, whatever it is, we can, because we've bought into this lie, we can have it all. I can have it all in my schedule. But guys, time and energy is limited. Let me tell you, you can't have a great family, spend all weekend playing with all your toys, stand connected with, with other believers in fellowship, you know, keep up with all of your followers on social media, and take martial arts on the side. It's just not typically going to work out. We can't have it all, even if we think that we can. And sometimes, you've heard this before, Good things are the enemy of best things. We've got to continually prune. So just some concepts there on priorities that I think are very, very important. As we come to this end of the year, and I'm like, man, what priorities should I be talking about? And then it's just so obvious what, what we're supposed to do here. Just so obvious. The Lord spoke this to me. And we're basically talking, the big idea here today is that the most important priority is connection. There's no, there's no greater, more critical, vital priority in your life. I mean, we could talk about a lot of important priorities. We can talk about health. We can talk about relationships. We can talk about, you know, um, you know lots of good, important priorities for our life. But connection sums up the heart of God. And so that's our title, of Priority of Connection. And, and when we talk about uh, this, this connection, we're really talking about three things. I was looking for a stool with three legs. Couldn't find one. I mean, all stools have four now. I, mean, I don't know what the problem is. Okay, but I'm going to try to find a three-legged one. But, but really, we're talking three very important uh, aspects of connection. And the first is to connect with God's Holy Spirit. Like That, by far, is, is, is so vitally important because God is alive. He's the living God. He's not, he, he's not an entity. He's not words black and white on a page here, Jesus red letters. He's the living God. And Jesus said, it's good. He told his disciples, he said, it's good that I go. It's good that I'm leaving, which really blew their mind. What do you mean, Jesus, is good that you're leaving? Jesus said, I must go because when I depart, I'll send the Holy Spirit and he'll be with you and he'll be in you. And so we often say here at River Valley, the Christian life is not so much God helping you, it's God living through you. Okay, it's good. So living God who comes to, and that's our power. He's our power and motivation. It's the Holy Spirit in us. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God's work, believing his work in and through you. I think sometimes there are Christians, I know I can get this way, and we can go weeks and weeks and weeks, and we just kind of put it all on ourselves. I'm living for God. Here's what I need to do. For, we totally miss the reality that this is, this is the Lord in us. And believing that by faith, and what a huge difference that that makes in our lives. Because it's him. Do not get drunk with wine, Ephesians 5.18, or on anything else for that matter. Don't be addicted to anything else because that leads to wild living. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And this is interesting. He's using that comparison. Don't get intoxicated with wine or anything else, but be intoxicated by the Spirit. Be filled up and controlled by the Spirit. And you don't have this in your notes, but just quickly, again, because you're Saturday, I can give this to you. So real quick here, this, this is what it means to be controlled by the Spirit, to have this relationship with the Spirit. And they all start with A. Okay, uh, you might want to write these down. H how do you get filled with the Spirit? A, be aware of Him. Be aware of Him. The Bible calls that the fear of the Lord, that he healthy respect and awe for God. Uh, second is to admit sin and, and confess it, that we don't keep sin in our lives, that we're dealing with it, that we're, that we're taking it before the Lord. And, and conf it's, it's admitting sin because the Holy Spirit can't take control of our lives and we got a bunch of sin and junk and garbage. Okay. Uh, third is ask. Jesus said oh, you'll be filled with the Spirit if you ask. Ask the Spirit to take control of our lives. We, we did a series years ago, we call it the forgotten God about the Holy Spirit. So often he's just forgotten. We don't even think about him. 
And he's everything to us. Connection with God's spirit. Fourth A, adore him. This is about a treasure, a relationship with the living God who loves us, who's committed to us. And, and we more and more to him is how it should work. And then and lastly, uh, addicted to him. To be a God addict. Like I have to be in relationship with God. I have to have his help. I have to have his support. Addicted to nothing else but the living God. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying connection with the Holy Spirit. This is a, such a privilege to know that our God is alive and that we have relationship with him. And we can, on just like we're walking, it, it says be in step with the spirit, to walk with the spirit. Oh, that's, that's my, I am not where I should be here. It's I want to be though. I want to trust and press in more to the spirit of God. The second connection, so important. And it's, and it's all these three are related. It's not like, you know, check, check, check. I mean, they all kind of connect together, three-legged stool. The second is connecting with God's word. And... The scriptures, God gave us one book, and the scriptures are his fuel for our lives, his, his map, okay, Get, again, the path, stay on this path. You think about how the word of God will nav- help navigate life, like if we, if we just did what it says, what would marriage, what would work look like? What would our health look like? What would, you know, uh, our, our, our serving the Lord uh, look like? I mean, our entertainment habits, uh, our, our friendships. See, God's that perfect father and he gives this to us so that we can have success in all of these areas of our lives. And he, he's like that, see, we're, we're like that kid. We're like, remember little kids? And they think they know best. And so a little kid says, when I'm old, I'll never brush my teeth and I'm never going to bed. Right? And so that's why kids need parents. So, so, they, get, so they still have teeth in their mouth by, when they're 35, okay? And, 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 but here's the thing. You get, you get to be an adult and, and you know you got to brush your teeth and, and, and you can't wait to go to bed, right? I mean, that's kind of how it works when you're... That's how it works for me. It's like, well, what, 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 eight hours away? You know, you want to get to bed. All right, so, but the thing is, it takes parenting. And so God is always that parent for us, and he knows what's best. And when we live our lives based on our own compass, based on our own map, it's a train wreck. And I think if you're honest, you, you'd admit that, that life without God's direction is a train wreck. And, and we need his help because if we base it on our own compass, it's just going to be all over the place. The Bible gives us God's compass and God's map. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I love that scripture. The Bible is so amazing to train us, to correct us to instruct us so that we'll be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so this next year, make a new commitment to the word of God. We have over here again a tool that we created a few years back called the Bible Reading Journal. And uh, we make these available. Actually, they're often up here for you, but especially at the first of the year, because in it is a Bible reading plan. Not that you have to follow that plan, but it's a guideline. It's actually, there's actually two Bible reading plans in here. And the Bible reading plan you choose really isn't that important as much as it is get into the Word for yourself. We call it being a self-feeder. Because, I mean, what kind of maturity does a person have if they can't ever feed themselves in life? The same thing in our spiritual lives. And so this journal is designed, it's our best effort, our best attempt to give you a tool. Like if you say, you know what, I just don't know, I'm struggling, I'm not sure what to do in my time with the Lord, it's not happening, or it's very sporadic, or it's very uh, dry, I'll say, here you go. And you just read the first couple of pages with a prayerful heart, 
and it'll just get you right on the path to knowing how to read the Bible and get something out of it and pray. There's a little, little nuggets in here on prayer. Okay? Now, if, if you are doing great and you're just ripping it up in your relationship with the Lord and your quiet time, and, and, and you then, then you don't need this, all right? But maybe this is the reason why, because it's given a lot of people tools to guide them in their relationship with God and to get into the Word. Uh, these are $5 our cost. If you don't have it, just take one anyway, and I know you'll bring, bring it in next week um, if, you, if you can do that. And um, these little baskets, you can put your cash in there and then take, take one or take a couple for gifts because these are really, really uh, important to help you. Uh, maybe you're not a reader. Maybe you're more of like an audio. Get, get, a, get a Bible on audio. You can do some commuting or whatever. You can listen to God's Word. Different ways to get God's Word uh, in your mind and in your heart. So connecting with the Spirit of God. That's the bottom line, the living God. Connecting with His Word. And then number three, connecting with God's people. Because if I'm not closely connecting with other believers, then I'm missing an essential ingredient. The people of God for healthy and, 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 and successful spiritual living. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider, I love this verse, how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, a lot of times I hear this verse used to support church attendance. Need, need to go to church, because the Bible says don't give up meeting together. And, and, and I think you can. You can support that, for, for, use that to support. But that's, it's way more than that, guys. We're talking here about a meeting, a gathering, where you can know and be known. Where there's that, as it says here, spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. Encouraging one another. So not just a place where you can be encouraged, but a place where you can encourage others. So church worship services like this one are, are, are great, very important. There's the teaching of the word. There's hopefully some inspiration. It can be a catalyst in our lives, or we're worshiping the living God corporately. That's all good, okay? But it can ne this can never provide support and accountability. It's not designed for that. That has to be in face-to-face -face relationships. I call it being Velcroed for growth. And here's what I mean by that. Spiritual growth, I'll, I'll admit it. I was talking to a group of the life group leaders a few, few weeks ago. And by the way, we're gathering again next, next weekend, and we'll send out a heads up for you as we launch this new season. But um, we were talking about how mysterious spiritual growth is. There's not like a one, two, three step to spiritual growth. God grows us. So what we are committed to at River Valley is an environment for growth. That's, that's our responsibility. I can't grow you. You can't grow me. You can't even grow yourself. God grows you. We need to be in the right environment for growth, and that's a one another relationship group. Some kind of, like we call life groups here, that's regular, that's ongoing, where you can do life together and get into the Word together and get support for what, exactly why we have these things called life groups. So, and the reason that's important is because so much growth happens on a need-to-know, need-to-grow basis. What I mean by that is <laughs> you and I grow best as things start happening in our lives that we couldn't orchestrate. And, and not that like a sermon like this isn't helpful, but it's when we're going through the thick of it. We go through that health crisis, and all of a sudden we're digging into Scripture that maybe we weren't really we weren't really listening to before. Like, like, like let's say your, your daughter starts dating a Mormon. All of a sudden, you're interested in Mormonism, right? The Mormonism sermon that somebody gave was just like, you know, Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 right? It was just white noise until you are actually dealing with it. If your boss says, I want you to cut some corners, and he's asking you to break the law, 
then all of a sudden you have a crisis. It's, it's an opportunity for growth. All right? So I guess what I'm trying to say is when you have a group, you're in a much better position to be Velcroed for growth rather than to spin out like I've seen so many and just get out into na na land spiritually because they didn't have that support system to help them in what they're going through and what God has designed for growth in their life. And here's the thing. We never get a text from God that says, hey, it's coming tomorrow. It's just all of a sudden here. And do you have that, you have that support system? And let me tell you, it's got to be more than just your family. Family's great, but you need other believers in your life as well. So connection, the Holy Spirit, connection to the word and connection with other believers. I have seen that the biggest gap that most American Christians miss is number three. Everybody knows you need the Holy Spirit and everybody knows you need the word. But there's this attitude that a lot of us have that I don't really need other believers to grow. And so why is this so often ignored? Here, here's the reason, a couple of reasons. Number one, we've confused Christianity as being mostly about me and God. See, that's American individualism that's contrary to the Bible. Christianity is just about me and God. Where the Bible says that there's a relational nature to our lives and a, and a dependence, an interdependence that we have connected to one another as we're connected to God. Uh, part of the thing here that, that I think that fuels this is we really sort of idolize and, and exalt, you know, oh, well, they're, they're really smart in the Bible or they're just so close with the Holy Spirit. Now, good things, I'm not saying those are bad, but someone who's really relationally connected in the faith you don't really see that much like notoriety of, of that kind of a thing. It's like, oh, that person's just relational. Oh, wait a minute. They're really connecting. As Jesus said in Matthew 22, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? This guy came to Jesus, asked him that. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these two commands. The whole Bible hangs on the commands of love, loving God and loving people. Jesus said this in John 13, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So how do you love people? How do I love? See, this is, this is not natural for me. I, I'm definitely more of a word guy. like to think I'm growing in the spirit. But the relation, there are times I think, you know what, I don't know that I need it. But here's the thing. I have to have it because of scriptures like this. What is the faith if it's not love-based? What, what do we got? It must be rooted. Like, how do you love with all your heart if you're not in relationship with anyone? So, again, this whole thing about me, it's just about me and God. No, that, that's just part of it. Number two, why is this so often ignored? Because we we've confused going to church with being the church. Somehow we think that by going to church that we're we're living out our faith, that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. It's good to attend Christian gatherings, of course, but we are, more importantly, the church in action, the church as a verb. Now, why is this third point so important? This ignored part of the three legs Connect with Holy Spirit, connect with the Word, connecting with God's people. Why is this connection with God's people so important? First, we all live better when somebody else is watching. I mean, isn't that true? And we can say, well, I'm accountable to God. I don't really need, <laughs> but no, 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 no. 
that you've missed how he's wired this thing called Christianity that we would, as iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27, so one person sharpens another. See, there's a reason why there's more sin in the big cities. And I, and I don't want to play sociology dynamics here, but I mean, if you think about it, there's one simple reason, anonymity. Right? The more people that don't really know me, know what I'm about, okay, uh, the more stuff's going to go down. That's not good. Why, when you leave an airport, what do you see right outside of airports? Strip joints, adult, adult clubs, right? I'm here all alone. Nobody's watching me. Why, when pastors, I hate to tell this to you, but I've, it's just sickening to think why do pastors when they go to conferences have the have one of the highest porn problems on the tvs at the hotels and i'm finally away from that church and my wife and it's just it's sickening but it's true anonymity we do better when people are watching our lives and we're accountable. Second, we're taught in the New Testament to obey over 30 one another commands. How do you obey all the one another commands in a gathering like this? You can maybe obey, you can obey some, but as far as love, care, support, encourage, teach one another, correct one another and build up uh, one another, be devoted to one another, honor one another, forgive one another, serve one another. You know, so like a couple questions, like, so who am I putting up with? Some people leave groups because of this. I'm tired of putting up with that. It's like, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say to bear with one another? See, when we're in a big group like this, we don't really have to put up with anybody. You can leave here tonight and go, you know what, that guy bugs me, but I'm just so glad I don't have to hang out with him for longer, you know. But when you're, in, when you're in a relationship, you have to learn how to deal with things. You've got to learn how to, you know, of course, speak the truth in love at times. But, but, but to put up with people and, and growing to love and accept and to be more patient. And too many of us, if, oh, they bug me, so, they, so we bail. That's, that's too bad. Who am I showing hospitality to? That means lover of strangers or open home. That's important. Whose burdens am I bearing? I mean, again, I, I don't want to be seen as picking on this because I really believe in what we're doing here. But, but what burdens are being carried here? Right? You know what I mean? It's like we don't even know. We have no idea like what's going on in the, the person behind you in the road. You know, and, and you don't want them to know what's going on in your life. That's where a smaller group is so important. And then, here we go, who am I confessing my sins to? The Bible actually commands that. Confess your sins to one another and pray for each other, James 5. So where is that happening? Again, that's not going to happen here, and if it did, it'd be kind of weird. Are you some kind of spiritual exhibitionist? I mean, you're going to do that with just a few people and, and someone that you're in a relationship with and accountable to. And that need, you, it, it's a command. Confess your sins. So what have we done in Christianity with that? Well, if we're in the Catholic side of things, we go to a priest. Probably better than nothing. If we're on the Protestant side of things, we go to a counselor. Or maybe a pastor. Again, better than nothing. But what about just with other people in our lives? Confess your sins when they pray. I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is these one another commands, they only can take place in relationships like a life group. And, 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 of course, it can come outside of a life group. set. Life groups are not, like, we didn't make up life groups. They've been around a long time. Uh, Christians gathering together. Jesus had one. You see them all throughout the Bible. But the thing is, we, we don't have anything else structurally here to, again, what are, what are we about here? What, what are we supposed to be doing as as leaders at River Valley, creating an environment for
for you to connect with the Holy Spirit and with his word and with other believers. And there's other things, of course, that we're supposed to be doing, but that's really it right there. And so here, here's the thing, guys. We can just create the environment. Then it's up to you. I, mean, I can't connect you to the Holy Spirit. I can't connect you to the Bible. I can't connect you to other Christians. That's where you have to say, yeah, I'll take that step. I mean, we've put a ton of work into helping you connect with the Lord and his word. I don't know what else to do than something like this. But again, it's, I mean, it's, just, it's just a book if, if, it, if it's not something that, that you like decide. I'm going to get into the word. Connecting you with the spirit of God. <laughs> Again, just trying to facilitate that and connecting you with other people. So there's so many groups in our church, and you could see here in the brochure, in the, in the quick guide, all of the openings in groups. And, and we have this 10-week winter season. And this is a time, maybe some of you have been holding out, you haven't been in for a while, or maybe you've never been in a group. And, you know, you can go for a week or two, and if it, that group isn't for you, we'll help you find another group, all right? But I guess what I'm encouraging you to do is to get plugged in to a group. And out in the lobby today, we've got like five different tables. And I hope that you'll, when you leave, you'll talk to one of the folks there, if you're not in a group, about how to get involved. And you might even want to take a minute and look at, you know, these groups here and say, you know what, that, that, I know that person. I'll check that one out. Or, or you know, that night's going to work for me. And so when you go out there, you can say, hey, this is a group that uh, I would be interested in. Uh, like I said, in a few weeks, the opportunities uh, are going to close. And, um, and I hate to see you miss out because this is, this is so, so important. Uh, we want to try to, in this next year, see greater connection uh, take place. What can be more important than connecting with the Holy Spirit of God, connecting uh, with his word, and connecting with other believers. So Father, I thank you for this whole concept of priorities and the importance of the, of the priority of connection. And Lord, your word makes it so clear that we need you, we need to be close with you. It's a, it, it, it should be a privilege, it should be a joy. And, and also the importance of having others involved in our lives and we in their lives in that process. And I pray that, you know, for some here that might be threatening, but they'll step out and they'll try it out and get connected to a group. There's a lot of things I'm sure that um, you're speaking to us about our lives and, and other priorities that are important, but I just pray that we will uh, remember and stay focused on these simple three today, and really one, which is connection with you, your word, and others, Lord. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.